So who determines the narrative? When I follow the news, I often notice that there is one dominant narrative for, for what's happening. So who determines that narrative? Where does that come from? Like who, who are the people who determines who have that, that power? So for example, think about the rise of Donald Trump. Right? There, there was one dominant narrative for that story in, in the, so, for example, think the mainstream media. And that was, you've got this unruly outsider who, who breaks all the rules, who's essentially mounted a hostile takeover of the Republican Party, and now trying to mount a hostile takeover of our democracy, and our democracy is at threat. Uh, think about the rise of Barack Obama. Here you have this uh, messianic uh, black man who's, whose election as president of the United States is going to redeem America from the, the great sin of racism. Uh, think about Russiagate, right? For three years, that was the dominant news story from the, the end of, of 2015 until, uh, what, the, into 2019, this idea that Donald Trump may have colluded with Russia, or at least that uh, Russia was messing with our state, was messing with our election. So who determined a news story that, on, on the face of it, didn't really make much sense? Whenever I try to read the Russiagate stories, I just get a headache because there was no way that Russian interference was a dominant factor in the election of Donald Trump. It seemed like a distraction from reality, but it, it met a need for a lot of people to explain the election of Donald Trump. And so even though there were very few facts behind the idea that Donald Trump actively colluded with Russia and that determined the 2016 election, there was a tremendous demand side for that narrative. So there are at least two factors that go into determining the winning narrative, right? One factor is the supply side. And if there's a small group of people, for example, who get to say what knowledge is, then maybe there's a small group of people who get to say what the narrative is. That's on the supply side. So this is Larry McInerney, former head of the University of Chicago writing program. And he's talking about... There are conversations moving through time and there's a bunch of people and they get to say what knowledge is. All right, so he says knowledge is a conversation moving through time and there are a small group of people in each area of knowledge who get to determine what knowledge is, right? They're, they are the experts and who is an expert? An expert is someone that other experts say is an expert. And if expertise is way beyond the, the ken of the ordinary person, then the ordinary person has absolutely no say on who the expert is. And when you look at uh, the publications that academics read, they are far removed from the publications that dominate uh, popular concerns, right? So what goes on in the popular news media usually has little effect on what our knowledge elites determine is knowledge. And what got me thinking about this was an essay by Amanda Alexander. Uh, the essay is called The Genesis of the Civilian. So I didn't realize that civilian was a whole brand new category established after the First World War. I, I thought civilian was an eternal, changeless notion that has, has gone on through time. But it turns out that uh, the whole concept of the civilian is a specific way. It is a contingent way. It is a historically conditioned way of viewing non-combatants that can be traced to the First World War. And part of her essay notes that the dominant narrative of World War I was shaped by the poets. And it wasn't that way initially, right? There were many narratives of World War I during World War I and in the immediate years after World War I. By the late 1920s, however, the narrative of the World War I poets became the dominant narrative of World War I, to which all other narratives must bow. So who determines that, right? Who, who determines that uh, the perspective of the World War I poets was the dominant narrative to which all other narratives of World War I must pay obeisance.